Hey folks, this is Terry. We're here with the November 13th edition of the IPFS Local and Offline Collaboration Call. There are probably a few words I missed in there somewhere, but lovely to see everyone. Um, so we are starting off today with a demo from Lido, which I will let him describe what he's demoing. So feel free to steal the screen. This will be a very brief demo, mostly as a like encouragement for discussion. Uh, we've been always talking about hosting websites on IPFS, but what about co-hosting? If there's a website I want to contribute my bandwidth to to keep it alive, or I want to sort of like a, like follow a website. If there's a new version, new update, how can I maybe pre-cache those new versions. Uh, so those versions are available to me instantly because my local node already has them. Or maybe other people in my local network may benefit from having access to those new versions. So instead of like going too deep uh, too soon uh, in uh, low level uh, parts of IPFS uh, stack, um, we've been thinking what can we do with existing APIs? So we have this concept of MFS, which is a mutable uh, file system. It's basically an abstraction. There's a pretty good, uh, pretty good tutorial on that. If anyone wants to learn, there's a tutorial. Look at that, a Proto School tutorial. Yep. So I wonder I, who made that. It's a great tutorial. Carry on, carry on. So uh, if you want to learn on details of MFS, uh, there's a tutorial, but basically we've been thinking, oh, that's a kind of the highest abstraction level API we have right now. It's very familiar to people. It exposes file system like uh, abstractions. And we already built uh, this web file screen in our web UI which lets you uh, browse those MFS resources. So it looks like a file system. There's a file, there's a directory, right? Um, so that's when we started figuring out, okay, so can we build something using existing primitives to simply make it easier for co-hosting websites? without the need for installing something bigger, like IPFS cluster. Like IPFS cluster is great, but not everyone wants to run a cluster of IPFS nodes. Most of people run just like IPFS companion and IPFS desktop and that's it, right? So the idea was, oh, can we create something much simpler, uh, but targeted at those users who go to some very good tutorial or, uh, maybe Wikipedia mirror or some blog they like, and they want to simply help contribute bandwidth and storage to that. So we uh, came up with very simple uh, spec for basically that. And if you go, the, like, the meta repository is in IPFS shipyard under co-hosting repo. I'll post link later in the notes. But basically the spec is very simple. It's a set of, conventions for storing those websites on MFS and a set for basic operations such as adding, removing, listing, updating snapshots, maybe changing a uh, co-hosting type and then well, if you run out of space you can prune all their snapshots. And basically if you look at this it's like super super simple. It's just creating directories and removing directories and checking if directory exists. So if I create uh, a directory for some site ID, and site ID is basically either domain name or IPNS uh, key. So when you create a directory for a specific site, um, the co-hosting simply will fetch uh, that website and kind of import it to your local node. 
and there are, there are commands for updating snapshots. And there are two ways of those snapshots, uh, two types of those snapshots. So one type is lazy, which means you simply add this website to co-hosting locally, but you don't fetch entire thing. You just keep like a pointer. And if you go to that directory here, let's say if I go to co-hosting, there's a full, but let's say it's lazy for the purpose of this. Uh, and there's some other stuff here. Only the stuff I actually traversed will be fetched. That's why it's called lazy. It does not fetch entire thing uh, up front. Uh, the second type is full. It just, the moment you add it to co-hosting, it fetches entire thing. Why we have those two types of co-hosting in this initial proposal? Because I want to emphasize it's an experiment. So. Um, why we have uh, two types? One, uh, not every it's targeted to regular users and basically uh, consumer grade like laptops, maybe phones, don't have that much space. The space is cheaper, but not that much uh, of the space is available in local machine. So let's say you go to Wikipedia Mirror and you want to co-host that. Here's the edge case: uh, English Wikipedia mirror on IPFS takes 650 gigabytes and a lot of people don't have disk of size that would be able to fetch it uh, to keep to basically contain that uh, amount of data however still people don't really care about maybe people don't care about like entire English Wikipedia people mostly care about pages they visited and that's perfectly aligned with how IPFS works the blogs, the pages you visited are cached in a local IPFS node already. That's built into IPFS. So the idea is to simply leverage the fact that things that you add to MFS are implicitly pinned, which means those things won't be garbage collected when you, your node starts running out of space. So the only thing that lazy co-hosting does, it creates those pointers in MFS to ensure if you visit a page on Wikipedia, that page will be implicitly kept around until you de decide to manually remove it from MFS. And that's the difference. The full, full snapshot is when you snapshot entire thing. Uh, and it's all the blocks are fetched the moment you add a mm, page to your co-hosting setup. So I've been talking a little bit about specs and uh, the high level concepts, uh, but we actually have a command line tool. Um, can I just, can yeah. I just interrupt with a quick question? So the person who's making a directory called co-hosting is the person who wants to co-host a website or the person who makes the website originally has to say, I'm setting this up so that it will be easy for people to co-host. Oh. Uh, the person that uh, setting up the website uh, does not have to do anything. Okay. It's just people who want to contribute can use this set of conventions and the command line tool I will demo shortly uh, to simply to make to make it easier for them to contribute to that website. You don't need to even know who created that website as long as this website is on IPFS and it's using either uh, IPNS or DNS link, you will be able to co-host it. And uh, yep, so we, the, the over, overarching idea is to kind of exp we use this uh, spec for experimentation and then uh, maybe start uh, with uh, implementation. So the first implementation is the command line tool, which is easier to play with and easier to change in the future. But uh, at some point, we would like to in introduce those integrations into our browser extension, which is IPFS Companion, which means when you go to distributed Wikipedia, there would be like user interface element, which lets you simply add Wikipedia to your co-hosting website or any other website. Uh, Another thing is how to make sure those websites are updated, kept uh, up to date in the background. 
we are thinking maybe we could make IPFS desktop periodically check each site you have in your co-hosting roster. Uh, are there any updates? Uh, and if it's like a full snapshot uh, website which you want to do full snapshots of, it would like prefetch that website for you. But at this point, we only have this command line tool, which I want to demo shortly. You, it's a, a node app. You can install it from from npm. It's called IPFS cohost, and I believe I should be able to demo it here. Uh, yep. So you've seen nothing. Uh, so the idea is. Okay, I want to add website docs IPFSIO to my co-hosting websites, uh, to my co-hosted website. Um, so maybe I'll show you available comments. Yep. So basically, comments are you. You can add website, you can remove website, you can list websites you are co-hosting. Um, you can change the type of co-hosting between this lazy type and full type. If you, let's say you have small disk, then you move to a bigger one, you, you may want to switch to full, or maybe you decide, oh, this website is not that important to me, I'll start doing lazy snapshots. You can change the type here. Uh, there's a sync command, which goes through every website and checks if there's a newer version, and if so, it fetches it and updates. Uh, your co-hosting directories. You can add it to like uh, cron or some periodical schedule your machine is doing. So it happens in the background. And also things like IPFS desktop could have that as an option at some point in the future. And if you're running off, uh, out of space, you can remove all snapshots apart from like the last one of two. Is that syncing to the most recent version a thing that's new to this tool or a thing that if something is on IPNS or DNS link right now, that's a thing that already happens? Uh, this, if we, we sync, we check IPFS, either we check IPNS or we check DNS link, if there's an updated version. And by updated version, we mean, oh, is the latest snapshot different than the one we have uh, right now? Uh, it's maybe better if I like illustrate this. So it's IPFS co-host. I want to add docs IPFS IO. And let's say I added this as lazy. Uh, there are pretty emojis here, but not on Linux. During my stuff. Uh, all right. So I've added what happened here. I have IPFS daemon running on my machine that is like IPFS desktop, go IPFS, whatever you have. You can see that the tool fetched entire uh, docs IPFS IO. It results it to this content ID. And entire website takes seven megabytes in size. But it did not fetch entire thing because it was like a lazy version. Um, and if I go to web UI to files, you can see I have in files co-hosting directory created. And if I go there, I have full and lazy subdirectories. And if I go to lazy, I have a domain name of the website I'm co-hosting. And if I go into docs IPFSIO, I have a timestamp of the latest snapshot. There's only one snapshot because I just added it. And if I go inside that snapshot, it's basically the website. And I can even, like, see the HTML, even more, I can copy hash and probably, probably uh, browse it. Uh, but more or less, the idea is that you have access to snapshot using web UI. And at the same time, you are contributing uh, to co-hosting that website. Another cool thing is that you don't need to use command line tool. If you decide that you don't care about this website, you can simply remove it here. And it's no longer lazy co-hosted. Um, 
Is there a reason that this needs to be split at the folder level between full and lazy? Because it feels like as an end user, I would want to see the domains right here, not a full folder and a lazy folder. Yep, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, uh, question and kind of open one. Yeah, me too. I also am interested in that question, but I, I think I I'm more interested in answering it from a different perspective, which is I don't think an end user should ever see this screen. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm super excited about this work because I think it lays the foundation for higher level user flows. Like you're in a browser and you hit a button that says, I want to co-host this website. Oh yeah. That's and good. then later you can unstar or uncohost. Uh, and a user never has to understand that IPFS is even involved at all or care necessarily. Uh, and we have maybe higher level visual design guidelines for understanding what the repercussions are of your browser being a server that is serving content, whether it's IPFS or any other distributed protocol. So I think, I think this is an, I'm super excited about this work because it lays the foundation for other actual end user tools of which I think IPFS web UI is an IPFS user tool, not necessarily a web user tool at this point. Um, yeah. But I think oh, you, when, once these kind of conventions are tested out, we have a better understanding of what, does lazy actually make sense? Because it's actually saying that this will be destroyed at some point. It's not really lazy. So there's a, a whole bunch of other things that are probably need to be communicated through there as well. But this is an early experiment in trying to figure out what is the right, what, maybe what's the right language, what's the right pattern, do we need lower level protocol support for things like this? Or is a convention at the MFS level okay? Is that, is that a, a coarse enough tool for us to experiment with? Um, but I, I, I would say from an end user standpoint, this is all still very, very far from. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. And I, I kind of, I started with the most boring part, especially to highlight the fact that it's like very, very unusable to end user. Because you should think about this as an early experimentation of uh, the simplifying our APIs or like simplifying those concepts to the point we can make a library from them and then we can build a user interface around them. And to illustrate that, there's a full and lazy subdirectory here, mostly to make it easier for people who started playing with this uh, command line tool to quickly understand, oh, those snapshots are full snapshots, those snapshots are par partial. However, the end user, the end user goes to this website, right? And the end user can click in like IPFS companion or click here and they see option to pin this. This is how it looks today, right? You go to a website and you can pin this website. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, and that's the entry point, which we will eventually want to replace with co-hosting. But all those de details I, I just mentioned in the past like 10 minutes, uh, like differences between full and lazy, uh, conventions for directories, those are low level things. Those are high level things given existing APIs, but those are super low level things from the user perspective, people won't ever interact with them unless they really care about, oh, I've seen some picture on that website. I think I'm co-hosting it. I'll go to web UI and traverse the three, three and see that picture again, right? The idea is to replace this element here, pin IPFS resource. Right now, if I click on this, it will pin entire website recursively, and that's it. There's actually no UI for browsing all the websites I've been. Um, and if it's a Wikipedia, which is 650 gigabytes, it will be either fail in the background or it will like constantly try to pin it. You don't know because we don't even have, have an API for tracking that. And that's the most, the, that's the key purpose of this experimentation to even to identify those missing pieces to create user interfaces that we want. Because um, if we have here option, contribute or like co-host this website or something like that. And when you click that, 
you should not be prompted to pick between full and lazy. There should be a like safe default or some heuristic. We can tell that your node has this store like this limit of storage, and if website is over the limit, it should either pick lazy by default or inform user, hey, you don't have storage to host a full snapshot, but you can host a like the opportunistic or lazy snapshot. Even the language we are trying to invent here, lazy and full, it's just like temporary language we invented. So we kind of start a, a discussion about those uh, concepts here. Uh, I fully, fully, uh, fully agree that it's uh, not aimed at end users. And this tool is mostly to illustrate the idea. Uh, but the goal is to eventually either take this uh, set of conventions of keeping stuff on MFS, or maybe we will create new core APIs. But this way we can iterate uh, faster without like the long process of changing core APIs. Uh, we can like use MFS, co con build conventions on top of MFS, uh, see what works, see what does not. You just, like Terry, you just identified that, oh, lazy, why it's there, I would, expect those domains. Yeah, totally. Uh, and that was like one of those uh, discussions we had. Should we, uh, should we like put domains here and have like a flag inside of uh, a directory? So let's say if I have like lazy, oh, I remove it. I need to add it again. Um, I, 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 would, I would, yeah, I think looking at, looking at that list is more like looking at, um, when you open your browser, it actually, or like, so your IPFS repo is in a hidden directory in your user directory, or your browser profile is also, you know, in, in the application support directory or in a hidden directory in your operating system. And I, I think that this is really what we're looking at is kind of the contents of that hidden directory. And that's probably okay. a, the best corollary to think about. And also keep in mind that right now, we just dropped it into co-hosting directory in web UI. However, if it becomes a thing, this, that could be like a special director which is not on this regular list. It could have a different user interface, which is uh, more around uh, the concept of co-hosting and things like that. Uh, so it's just like a conversation starter more than actually usable thing. And once again, it's like experiment in MFS-based co-hosting. But one, uh, one of the things that I think is cool is too, is that really displays the strength and power of having that file system uh, virtual file system. So, uh, and to some extent, it talks about the strength and power and actually just using a file system instead of a repo. And that's one of the, when people contrast DAT and IPFS, uh, IPFS seems a little opaque from a developer standpoint, even because everything is hidden away inside this repo. Uh, even in a Git repo, you're still talking about a repo, but really working directly with the file system. And IPFS is really different in that way because that repo is that black box and you're not working directly with the contents of the files. You're taking them and putting them in the fridge and then you close the fridge door. And then you open up the fridge and you pull something out and then you close the fridge door again. So your visibility as a developer or designer of the sum total of things that are in the fridge is always obscured by that door. And that's how, kind of how I see this type of issue. So the power of having that file system view, what MFS provides, that mutable file, what we call mutable file system, other people just call daily reality, what they have all the time, uh, <laughs> is, is that it gets us a little bit closer to being able to do this type of experimentation. And the fact that, that you know, Lytle and, and Hack can, and Ollie can use that MFS abstraction to be able to come up with these types of conventions that allow us to play with higher level application patterns, like what a little bit closer at least to what a user just wants to do. I want, I want a Wikipedia extension that I know if I have that extension installed, it just auto saves the Wikipedia pages I've been to and serves those. Like that, that's really what I want to do as a user. I don't care about any of this stuff, right? So uh, this gets us a little bit closer to the point of being able to say, do something like that, where you take the core of, of um, I'm envisioning, you know, broad strokes again, of feature where we have maybe a share or a send or a save or republish extension, not an IPFS extension. So something that translates to what user needs are 
a little bit more directly. And uh, experiments like this are fantastic because they help us kind of envision what, what those op opportunities and those permutations might be. Adding to that too, um, I think it's really, I, I love the fact that it's path-based. So stuff like that, when you, you're not only talking about like cross language at that point, you can potentially have like cross application um, utilizing the same data as well. So when you're talking about like send and receive and stuff like that, the, in my mind, that's, that's where I'm, I'm going of like, oh, it's really cool that we can just have this convention that is shared uh, across multiple applications like that. Um, that's really cool. If someone figured out how to host on IPFS a website that was more dynamic, like a single page application or something and dealt with whatever you have to deal with, with hash routing and all that jazz, would that then be able to be co-hosted like this too, or would it run into extra bumps? The reason I ask is like, if you're thinking about an application where like you put whatever you want in the URL and then it was sucking in data from an API or something, how are you predicting all of the possible permutations? You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. So that's uh, but going back to the like general question. Okay, so stuff on IPFS. IPFS is great for immutable static websites. How do you introduce uh, mutability in general? Um, I think that's sort of like uh, separate. Uh, it's like not specific to co-hosting, but like co-hosting is uh, mostly about about keeping those initial assets you need to fetch to bootstrap the dynamic web app. Uh, the dynamic web app could be like JS, which uses uh, CRDTs or some other magic to introduce uh, mu like mutability and persistence of mutated sta state somehow. However, to boot to like boot that web app, you need to fetch those static assets, and that's what you would be co-hosting. So the next person that wants to visit that website for the first time needs to fetch those static assets. And you will be one of uh, peers that provide them. Uh, I, yeah, I think that's a separate, kind of separate uh, discussion from co-hosting. Um, my sort of like uh, the default use case I have is mostly like Wikipedia, because that's a very good example of edge case when you have a very valuable, like very, uh, universally valuable, a website to, to, to a lot of people, but at the same time, it's too big to be stored on a single website. You may have subsets of people who care about different subsets of this website. And that's uh, how can we create a UI or some conventions for uh, people seamlessly contributing uh, uh, bandwidth and, uh, and storage without actually making any decision. So I totally agree that we, the decision between like lazy and full, that should be like hidden from the user. Those are like low level primitives. The challenge here is to how to frame the language, the user interface and like entire like interactions, or maybe even like the life cycle of the data. Uh, so someone published, uh, single snapshot of Wikipedia, how that single snapshot can be uh, co-hosted by a group of people who actually have no central coordination. People just care about subsets of that website. Um, so that's what, uh, what I find really exciting. And it's, even if it's uh, pretty simple, it already uh, opened a lot of, uh, new venues for thinking and also prob it identifies problems with our APIs. Even the fact that we are not able to track a preload of huge websites such as Wiki Wikipedia. You have 650 gigabytes and we are not able to, uh, to track progress. Um, we may be aware of that problem, but it's uh, highlighted by by this uh, experiment that if we want to build user interfaces, we would have to add APIs that give, you, uh, give us a better insight of uh, block store. So 
people would uh, want to, people need to know what part of Wikipedia I have stored on my local disk, right? Uh, what percentage of that 650 gigabytes I already have cached locally? Um, those are like hard problems, not only like technically, uh, but also like how to communicate that. Uh, some prior art, are, like some prior art can be found in like BitTorrent or other peer-to-peer -peer sharing uh, apps. Um, they have some, uh, they are a bit uh, much better on showing what's happening, how much data you already have locally, who's fetching from you and things like that. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, I co-hosting spec. I mostly wanted to uh, put it there uh, to mention that we, we started experimenting. Uh, it, we put a pause on this, so it stays like this at least until 2020. But I believe uh, it's at the point when it's worth uh, playing. We got this command line tool released uh, recently. That's why I wanted to demo it. Yep. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dietrich, is this Web Bundles one you? Yeah. What do you uh, want to talk about? Yeah, yeah, so I um, was at Chrome Dev Summit yesterday. And the day before was the first day, and they announced web bundles. Uh, previously, Google's been talking about um, the web packaging specification and the set of related technologies. Uh, they were using it initially as a standardization approach towards their AMP efforts, which are somewhat controversial, uh, but also are, uh, in interestingly, they have a characteristic with regards to the web security model that is uh, kind of closer to what IPFS is doing in terms of the separation of content from location. The way that web packaging was initially uh, set up was the idea that you could, uh, or communicated was the idea that you could take, say, uh, uh, portions of your website uh, as, as replayed HTTP requests, bundle those up, sign that bundle of, of uh, HTTP requests and the assets that the server would respond with, with the certificate that you have for your domain, your SSL cert, and then take that bundle and put it on Google servers. And then Google could serve that set of pages from their, from their servers to your users very, very quickly. And you would still have the nice little security UI in the browser that says that you are at that actual website, say Terry's website, uh, even though that website that is Terry's website came from a zip file that was signed and sitting on Google servers. So it is a implementation of a web technology that actually does separate content from location to some extent, but the encryption pathway that it uses and the, and the security model that it assumed at the end I mean, rendering of that website in the browser, it still works perfectly under the uh, security model of the web today. So in some ways, it, broad strokes, similar, the separation of content from location, uh, but in the actual implementation still stays within the paradigm of the web security model as we understand it. Web bundles is the kind of next follow on, follow on step from that original specification where you can package all the different assets into one bundle. Uh, and Lytle actually has been kind of tracking him and Jipic have been tracking and looking at this technology for a really long time. Uh, but because it's a uh, offline friendly technology that was announced in its current form yesterday, I thought it might be worth bringing up here and sharing with people and getting people's thoughts on, or at the very least introducing people to the fact that it exists and may be implemented at some point as a uh, standard by default in Chrome or a Technology by default in Chrome, not standard until some other browser implements it. Um, explain again how it's offline friendly. You can. We're talking about like normal websites on the nor normal internet, right? Normal like websites on the on? normal okay. internet, you can bundle up, and in their uh, on their web page, they actually share a demo uh, with. Uh, I'll share this. Uh, here's the web page for getting started with bundles on their uh, fancy new website, web.dev. And uh, here's a visual aid, all of your web resources uh, bundled up into one fancy, uh, looks, looking, looks like an installable package, which is interesting. Um, uh, however, this visual representation is not, not 
helpful in that it doesn't portray the fact that these are uh, essentially HTTP resources, not just static assets. So it's almost a, it's like a bundle that contains a tape, and that tape is a log of the HTTP exchange back and forths between a client and a server, and you re replay those. Uh, so it's not actually as simple as, as this visualization um, shows, but it, it's the high level. It kind of works that way. Uh, but the demo they have here is interesting in that it is a web bundle between a game shared between two phones that are sharing it over, uh, I think, web Bluetooth in this one, but basically any, uh, you could do it over local subnet or you could do it over Bluetooth. Uh, if there's a way that you could actually get these two Chrome browsers that have web bundles uh, uh, enabled and implemented, you can share a website basically offline, the entirety of it. But I'm not gonna play that video right now. <laughs> So I'll put the URL. Oh, it looks like Lytle already put the URL in the notes. So if you want to check it out, thanks, Lytle. Speaking of the notes, I've been attempting to take notes, but anyone who has actually shared something should go back and fix the notes so they're accurate because I tend to butcher them a little. Cool. And then was this one you, Dietrich? The recipes? Yes. Magically yes. appear. So, there. so I, have, I have a couple of people that, I, that you know, that being being somebody who worked in web stuff for a long time, did DevRel for a long time, people reach out to me, they're like, how can IPFS meet my needs? Uh, I, and so one person in particular reached out and he commented on um, one of the local and offline uh, issues, I think, with some use cases around uh, work he's doing in Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, one of these is work for UNICEF at a Bangladeshi um, displaced peoples camp where uh, everybody's got a smartphone in this in this camp, but the internet access is very poor. The quality is low. The bandwidth is low. Uh, the network goes up and down. But within the camp, there's a lot of interpersonal sharing of resources. So they have things like they've tried to set up like local media web servers and things like that. Um, but it, he, so he's it's, it's almost like a a, a a partial offline use case. And he said the number one is because a lot of the people in this camp are also not literate. The number one use case they have is for local distribution of media, photos and videos. And there are not a lot of applications that well support that. And uh, he, he said, oh, you know, he, he, he's, he's not a programmer, but he's technical enough. And he's, he's been running open source workshops for years. Like I met him in, in Hanoi in 2010, where he was spending his Saturdays running Ubuntu accessibility trainings for just that because he thought it was great and people need to know it. Uh, this really awesome person who's long, long, long done this kind of work. And he knows that the number one problem he has for these contracts, uh, for this you know, work that he's doing for UNICEF, is DNS. Everything in the web is tied to this remote resolution. That require, like, uh, uh, there's all kinds of web stack technologies that work in a vacuum offline just fine. But ultimately, it comes down to the fact that he needs that resolution in order for any of this stuff to work. Uh, even the stuff that says it works offline, it doesn't work offline out of the gate, out of the box. It needs to make that initial connection even. Uh, so uh, everything for him, as, as somebody who's in the field, trying to build practical offline applications, a APKs are, are a million times better than the web because you can put APKs on an SD card, hand it to somebody, the Android phone will load them up and install them. And the web is ultimately problematic as long as it depends on DNS. Sorry, did you say APK? APKs, yes. So the, what is the that file Stanford? format, which is the package of an Android application. Oh, so okay. you can take an Android native application. It is a single file that you can put on an SD card, put that in your phone, and your phone will be able to open that up and install it as an application. So uh, I, again, hearkening back to the kind of installable web applications that, that web bundles that we just talked about are trying to eventually maybe get to, uh, APKs already have that from a kind of uh, form and function standpoint, uh, very, very easy and seamless for people in that regards. Whereas the web, as long as it has this uh, location-based uh, model, that it will always have that constraint. It, it depends on, on the network. Coming up, from a philosophical standpoint, there is a network dependency from step zero of initiating a web request. Uh, IPFS does circumvent this to some extent, but of course we are in the, that awkward user experience standpoint of trying to say, well, open up the browser, the thing that requires the thing online, 
that general purpose tool that you use to be able to get to the internet at large and then put in this you know, long, long string of things. So there, we, we have other problems that we need to solve. Um, but uh, this person asked for basically higher level recipes for using IPFS to do things like media and image distribution or build applications that might work offline. So I thought this would be the right place maybe to ask the com a community of people around where we can find those higher level application re recipes, as it were. Sounds really uh, close to something to the data hub stuff that I have presented at some earlier point in time. Uh, we could we could discuss about that. I would be interested to hear more or talk to this person uh, if, if yeah. Thanks. I will I will make the introduction. So, something I no, notice over and over is uh, how all projects in the web space and also like in the crypto space um, maybe crypto not because they have like ENS and I don't know the solutions but uh, it, eventually DNS becomes this single point of failure in in any DAP you look at to let, let let's say you've got uh, like distributed music player which keeps stuff on blockchain and stuff like that actually load the web app you need to hit dns first um and uh, so that's sort of like uh, been a recurring theme we are solving all the pro like we are sort of like solving problems along the way but this is like the first thing remains the problem and sort of like um we've been Having those like loose discussions about um, is there something we could build on top of lip 2 p or maybe like additional service exposed by IPFS nodes um, to harden or DNS or make it like more robust somehow. Um, basically, the idea I often go back is what Tor project is doing. There is a way to basically make your Tor daemon to expose DNS service on some port, local port. And if you set your local host as a DNS server, then all the DNS uh, requests, instead of going to your local ISP or someone else, uh, go to Tor network and come out at random exit node and that exit node does the lookup and then the response goes through Tor network back to you. So it's obviously super slow, but if you are like caching those uh, record, re result records locally, you, the, only the first time you re request for a domain will be slow. And then I wonder if there's anything we could do better in IPFS given the fact that instead of relying on a single node to make a lookup for you, perhaps we could ask a subset of peers that we are connected to, hey, can you resolve this for me, this DNS thing? And then you get, let's say 20 responses, 50 responses. And then you can tell, oh, like 10% of those responses uh, give me different IP. Why is that? That could be because they get uh, like closer, uh, closer IP bec because of uh, uh, geolocation for that specific peer, DNS may return a closer IP, but also it could be an effect of like blocking at the DNS level, like censorship, stuff like that. And then if you gather those, like let's say 20, 50 responses, you can tell, okay, I need like a quorum, like 50 plus one, uh, percent to actually successfully resolve uh, a DNS address. Uh, so it, ju just like a, an idea, what if, is the, if there is, because I feel there is a need to actually, maybe not, uh, even we are not able to like immediately replace DNS because it, it's been around for a long, long time and will be. It's a very well understood uh, spec. There are clients which speak it well, both over TCP, UDP, and like HTTPS. Um, 
So there's the idea that if we expose DNS service, uh, the hardened DNS service as a feature maybe of DP2P or IPFS, could that be useful in the context uh, that you described, Dietrich? Because uh, in that environment, perhaps uh, connectivity to DNS was limited, but maybe if that person was connected to like 50 peers in that specific country or, or place, someone could have that record in their cache. Um, ju just like, just, uh, just my, me musing around. Yeah, I, I, I really like the, from a, from a ro re like robustness and reliability, like uh, thinking about the worst possible network scenario, that seems to be a, a good characteristic of a, of, a, of a reliable, using, using P2B to do something like bolster the reliability and robustness of a, of a DNS-like technology. I, I think it, uh, it's really different, the type, the type of kind of like blue sky, what, what are the characteristics of how do we design a new internet protocol from scratch with characteristics like that built in? I think we still wouldn't end up with something like DNS. We might end up with some, some kind of um, fallback mechanism like that. But when you talk about kind of like what the what the the golden the ideal path through would be, like there there are ultimately just better ways of doing that. But as far as a way of bolting on some more reliability onto a system that is deeply ingrained in in in, in every almost every layer of a of the of the high, of the higher parts of application development, yeah, like even the diffuse uh, IPFS based music. Uh, uh, app I downloaded the desktop version, and of course requires me to make an HTTP connection to the even for the IPFS part. It only works if I can actually get cores to their website. Mm -hmm. And and just uh, just to be clear, uh, even if we don't expose this as a service to other apps, because we like Tor is doing effectively that you can point any the app that wants to resolve DNS at this port, and it acts as a DNS server. Even if we don't expose it as an external service, we still could use it to harden uh, DNS link websites. Because instead of basically relying on the DNS that is returned by your operating system, um, we could uh, add this additional reliability layer to DNS link websites and say, oh, I need this like sort of like a quorum. Or because uh, in case of DNS link, uh, we don't care about a record. So this uh, case when uh, DNS returns you uh, IP that's closer to you is no longer a case. The only type of record we care for DNS link websites is TXT and that one should be universal. And if someone is uh, sending you a different DNS link and everyone else is sending uh, something else, that may be because that one has more up-to-date version but it's more likely that someone is doing many in the middle on the DNS level. And if you ask more uh, than a single DNS server, then you are able to mitigate those types of attacks. Or DNS link websites work in an offline environment because someone you are already connected to has record cached, even if uplink is down. When I saw that um, issue that was posted, we have had a number of discussions at offline camp about either stuff in refugee camps or disaster recovery, a lot of it involving like mesh networking. Um, so there are articles both existing on the offline camp medium publication and supposedly coming soon from some of the folks who were just there. Like we had a refugee camp discussion and we had a building for low to middle income countries discussion. So there may be some new stuff coming out with those angles. So we have seven minutes. Is there anything else people would like to chat about today? To play the Jeopardy theme song for seven minutes. No? All right. Well, it's very cool. Lyle, thank you for the demo. That was very interesting to see. 
So if we were to, like right now we are off of our schedule because we did the second Wednesday instead of the third. If we were to go back to our normal schedule, it would be Wednesday, December 18th, which is one week before Christmas. I don't know how many folks are taking super long vacations and how many people would still be around on the 18th. I'd probably still be here. Does that say 18th seem reasonable to people? Yep. yep. Okay. All right. We will get back on that schedule then. Um, and I think just for the sake of um, reducing admin workload, I'm going to switch. It's been like a different issue per meeting, but I'm just going to switch it back to one issue and change the name so it reflects the time of the meeting. So I will just make a new one that will keep forever and keep updating. So if anybody has ideas for future events, as always, there will be some kind of issue there that you can drop them in and we can keep updating the same agenda here with next time. So I will see everybody in a month-ish. <laughs> or some of you next week in person. See you later. Bye. Bye.